So we welcome you to our uh, GCA, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, namaskar, and a very good morning to this lovely gathering. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this 22nd Global Conference of Actuaries, which I understand the physical meeting happening after a lapse of a couple of years. I would like to extend my warm greetings to all the dignitaries on the dais and a warm welcome to all the distinguished delegates who are present here today. Uh, being amongst the actuaries actually makes you feel very glad as I believe that the actuaries are the real soldiers or I should call them as the principal drivers of growth as far as the insurance sector is concerned. And I think the responsibility primarily lies on the actuaries who can take the sector to its new heights. Uh, I will like to use this forum to address all the present and future actuaries on the immense potential that the sector has and in order to make insurance a mainstream subject and be a very active partner in our collective mission of insurance for all by the year 2047. That is the year when our country turns 100. Uh, it was around this time last year that I had been appointed uh, as the chairperson of the IRDA. And uh, the, the major thing which caught my attention was the significantly low insurance penetration and insurance inclusion, despite the fact that the insurance industry has been in our country uh, for almost 200 years, and it dates back to somewhere around the 1800s. So, looking at the fact that a 200-year-old industry and still our people are not adequately protected, our businesses do not have adequate coverage, our property is not insured. So all of these are a great matter of concern, and it's not that we cannot find solutions. We can find solutions, we will have to put our heads and minds together, carve out strategies, and with a very positive set of mindset, we can really achieve this target. During my discussions with the colleagues at the IRDA, many times we have discussed about one in a 200 year catastrophe, uh, an event, a catastrophe event while pricing, and a one in a 200 year event in capital modeling and so on and so forth. Now, huge catastrophes, even every one keenly accounting for and rightfully so. But I always wondered how many of us saw such low insurance penetration or density despite our existence from the same period of 200 years as an equal challenge, and if not more. Is it not a major tragedy? This is a question I would like to raise. The growing economy of India the startup ecosystems, the MSMEs, the businesses, properties, vehicles, people, health, and can go on and on. All need adequate cover and protection. Have we been able to provide that? Friends, I think this is your 99.5 or the 99 and a half percentile moment. This is your one in 200 year opportunity. This time you all have, you all have to provide for the growth of the insurance sector. You have to factor and design insurance inclusion. This is the moment where you have to underwrite disruptions which will change the face of insurance. We cannot afford to delay it further. We are already at the edge. Now, as far as the IRDA is concerned, from the regulatory standpoint, a slew of reforms have been undertaken and a lot more are in the offing. The first, the primary, uh, change or uh, the, the, the uh, paradigm shift that has been actually made is to move away from a rule-based approach of regulating the sector to a principle-based. I think that's the big ticket reform that has been initiated at the IRDI. With that, a large number of regulations have been changed, which provides more flexibility and ease of doing business as far as the industry is concerned. How do we make the distributors more efficient? How do we bring down the cost of insurance for our citizens? All of these are questions and these regulations which have undergone change attempts to create that ecosystem 
in order to provide affordable insurance and insurance which is available and accessible even to the citizen who are sitting at the last mile. Uh, now, as far as the need to see the sector is concerned, and we need to see it from the perspective that what are the challenges and I will underline what are the opportunities. We have a huge market. We have very few players. We need more distributors. We need more players. We need differentiated kind of players uh, or insurance entities to cater to the needs of our citizens. How do we reach out to the last mile? Is uh, technology not available? Today, India is the ecosystem for the startups. InsurTech is proliferating in a big way. How do we mainstream that? How do we create a UPI-like moment for the insurance sector? These are all the opportunities we have, and if we deploy them rightfully, then we will be able to reach out to every nook and corner of the country and also provide insurance solutions to different segments of the society. One size fit all is not the approach which a country like India needs. We have to have different solutions for different categories of population, for different kinds of businesses. We have micro entrepreneurs, we have small entrepreneurs, we have medium sized entrepreneurs, we have large corporates. We need to have insurance solutions for each of these uh, categories of uh, businesses. Now, what I'd like to request you is that the critical role that you play, uh, you have to look at the insurance sector with a fresh pair of eyes and a new pair of lens. You are the ones who hold the steering wheel of the sector. The CEO and other key management personnel, they all listen to you. The chairperson of your company listens to you. There is a need to come out from the traditional roles to be a more proactive leader. I would say that there is no rocket science in prescribing 15 rupees for a 10 rupee risk. Anyone could do that. I wouldn't expect that from an actuary. I would expect from an actuary to rather tell me if by some means we can even provide uh, 8 rupees uh, as the provision, still we are able to write a 9 rupee or 10 rupee risk. That is what uh, I would expect the actuary to tell, to tell me. Uh, what is the optimum? how can we optimally utilize the capital? You see, capital doesn't come for free. There is a cost to the capital, and it's not like it is available and you can pick up capital from any time, anywhere. And therefore, we need to be moving towards uh, the India model of risk-based capital regime. And IRDA has already embarked upon that journey, and work is in significant progress. And my team here, led by member actuary, are in touch with the actuaries uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, in the country to validate whatever we are doing, we are proceeding on the right direction. And as we go along and once we start implementing the risk-based capital regime, which I think we should be able to uh, you know, fully uh, ground it in the next two years' time, I am sure a lot of rationalization and capital consumption would follow. I think the real art lies in understanding the future or the emerging risks and ensuring that the company has commensurate absorption capacity. Along with looking back, we also need to look further. Just like doctors, you have to perform your operations while the company is still alive. I think one of the important things that the profession needs to do is to be more responsible, more responsive. You know, every profession has a responsibility for the society and for the citizens. I mean, a simple example, even a driver who ride, drives a bus has the responsibility because the, he's carrying maybe 100 lives and the, the, the lives depend on how safely he drives. Similarly, the actuary either makes the uh, industry grow or it can even make that industry fall. So uh, I, I would like to caution all of you that when you exercise your wisdom, it has to be done with a sense of uh, rationality and also with a sense of responsibility. And for that, what we need is more engagement, more conversations, more cooperation, and more coordination. You need to have the holistic view on the entire dynamics of the sector. But this is also not enough. As you all know, we are in an interconnected world. Understanding and creating the synergies across pan-financial services space is a must. What is happening in the banking sector? Or what is happening in the capital market sector? 
or what is ha happening in the payment systems, all of them impact. Then how global scenarios can impact? That also we need to factor. Now, if there is any increase or decrease in the rates by the US Fed, then what is the kind of action we need to take? What are the studies we need to do immediately to take corrective actions? Which side do you have to turn the steering wheel? Because you are the ones who are driving the insurance company. Your eyes must be on what lies ahead. For example, the reinsurance availability. We face serious challenges due to the ongoing geopolitical situations. However, as an immediate response, the MCET pool was created. So that is the kind of proactiveness which is expected from all of you. We need to have a constant eye on any future or emerging risk and be ready with the solutions. Then I'd like to dwell on another focal point, that is the actuarial department must not be insulated. You know, you cannot be functioning in an insulated manner. You need to talk to the different arms because ultimately the decision rests on you as to how you want to steer this whole process forward. I think there is a need for open dialogues to talk in a language which is understood by all. If we talk only technical, then we will not be able to reach to the grassroots. We will not be able to get any feedback and it will not be healthy for either the company that you are working for or for your own personal growth. Your CEO, your shareholder, or any other stakeholder for that matter may not be fully conversant in technical jargons. You must simplify it so that the best and coordinated decision making can happen. I appreciate that the Institute of Actuaries has kept one paper exclusively on communication, considering its immense significance. Now, engagement with the marketing department is a must. There must be a continuous and constant conversation. The products you design, it must have a huge component of feedback from the marketing department, and only then it will sell. It may so happen that you may design an excellent product, but only the executives in your company who are involved in distribution can tell whether it will sell or not, because they have the experience from the customer's viewpoint. You would know the technical specifics, no doubt, the marketing executives understand the customer more. So when a product is created with this joint synergy, that when you talk to your marketing and the marketing department talks to you, I'm 100% sure that the product will sell and the chances of mis-selling, etc., will be eliminated. You also realize that we are in a rapidly changing world, continuously evolving and moving at an ultra-fast speed. Similarly, for insurance, the times are changing. We will be venturing into the world of continuous underwriting and seamless insurance. For instance, drivers will see how their insurance costs fluctuate minute by minute, depending on the route that they travel, the state of the roads, the way they drive, and that will encourage them to drive more safely. Consumers will have the choice of paying for insurance as per their comfort. The way conventional insurance is offered will be altered and as a result of this, highly tailored offerings would be made available. We are moving towards a programmable world, as they say, our planet personalized. Now the young millennial population, the Generation Z, they want everything on tap, and that too flexible, both in terms of what is covered, how they pay for it, and therefore they are looking for products which are customized and suited to their specific needs. Change is also coming from a very non-millennial cohort, older people who are living longer and expecting more out of their retirement. The world's population is aging as a result of higher living standards and advancements in medical research, posing a new financial and care challenge. There is a need to create flexible retirement plans for an evolving later life environment. Most of the policyholders today would like to have a DIY that a do-it-yourself or self-service approach to determine the best personalized option accessible to them. This has led to rise of various advisory technologies and tech tools like digital assistance. The point I am trying to make here is that as the technology progresses, the traditional roles will start to become obsolete. The highly efficient quantum computers will quickly be handling massive data sets 
and several sources revolutionizing risk modeling and decision making. Now, as you all understand, the importance of reliable data is so important for pricing, for underwriting, for claim servicing, and so on and so forth. Now, how do we bring about a change in our approach towards data, the data acquired, acquisition of the data or the flow of data from the insurance companies and other sources? And how do we actually go for the big data analytics? So the data management is becoming increasingly important. I would like to inform all of you that the Insurance Information Bureau of India, which is located here in Hyderabad, is again undergoing a major revamp. The way we were handling with the data, or the data management, is now going to see a series of changes. We just recently appointed a new CEO and a couple of other key management personnel, like the chief technology officer, the data chief data scientist, the chief, inf chief information officers, these are in the pipeline and they are also likely to be appointed in the next few days or months. So work is in progress and a lot of uh, data which is you know, not being analyzed or not being utilized by the insurance companies are now going to flow in a regular sequence and the analytics and the insights are going to be provided to the insurers and also to the uh, regulator and other bodies which uh, ultimately will help us in you know, uh, improving our underwriting, pricing and also the claim processing and servicing of the policyholders. Uh, today a big threat is in terms of uh, uh, frauds. A lot of fraudsters try to trick the system. Now with the help of data again we will be able to uh, detect and also give an early warning and also fraud mitigation uh, uh, techniques can be deployed uh, to prevent insurance companies in falling in the hands of the fraudsters. So work is in progress there also. Here the actuaries should also look at the IIB and suggest what more can be done, how it can be converted into a more robust data management center as far as the sector, insurance sector is concerned. So therefore, it is imperative that all professionals must evolve and be future ready, be it actuaries or be it the chartered accountants, be it company secretaries and so on and so forth. So here the role of the respective institutions becomes paramount. They need to create an environment that is forward looking and is able to create professionals for tomorrow who are able to cater to the evolving and the dynamic needs of the economy. The insurance sector, I would reckon, is at an inflection point and is opening up further. The need for fully qualified actuaries is on the rise. We have some 500 plus fellows as on date, if my data is correct, and I feel it is not sufficient even for the present demand. Now, we are also proposed to the government for a set of amendments to the Insurance Act. Once those are incorporated. There may be a situation that the number of insurers may outgrow as far as the number of available fellows are concerned. So therefore, the Institute of Actuaries must look at the same on priority. What could be the possible reason that we have such limited number of fully qualified actuaries despite the presence of the Institute for more than one and a half decade? I think there are other equally challenging examinations like the Chartered Accountants course, or getting into the IITs or IIMs, so lakhs of students are opting for these courses, clearing with flying colors, ensuring that there is no supply constraint in the market. So I think we need to look at the supply constraints, whether, whether the awareness of actuary as a career option is limited, or whether the profession is being, not being marketed well, or whether it is garnering enough attention from the student community. I think all of this needs to be introspected and necessary corrective action needs to be taken. Just one or two students passing in a particular examination may not reflect on students' lack of preparedness or lack of efficiencies. Rather, the institute must do a careful analysis on the process followed for examination, whether the course curriculum needs to be re-looked into, and they should be reviewed 
Is there any scope for improvement in examination structure, in the pattern, in the kind of uh, the, the papers are checked, whether practical training or coaching is required, and most importantly, you should also look at whether the course is affordable. Can a student from a humble background be able to pursue the course without a big financial obligation? However, for all this, to mitigate this, I think we can always organize student loans to pursue the course in actuarial sciences. And we will be willing to uh, also volunteer to help you in uh, reaching that objective. The institute must also deliberate on all of this and strive to match the unmet demand of the insurance sector for the fully qualified professionals. I think we need to create an army of actuarial sciences to drive the insurance sector towards universal coverage latest by 2047. Especially when the entire world is looking towards India for leadership, for markets, for opportunities and for employment. So, and the CEOs of the world are convinced that it, it, it is India's century and not just the decade. And let me also tell you that the UPI, the India stack, the Aadhaar, the ONDC, these are a few examples. All are leading the world. The insurance sector cannot leave behind. And if that happens, we will be behind by at least a decade. So therefore, it's a responsibility on all of us to take our sector to greater heights. We are the backbone. We serve the no noble cause of providing protection, providing strength in the times of distress to our fellow citizens. I would like to also congratulate all the delegates, all the actuaries for the great work that they are doing. And my address to all of you is that the challenge before us is even more. So we have to live up to the, those expectations and the potential and the opportunities that the sector has. The time has come to reimagine insurance as a very dependable instrument at the time of need. And as the theme of the conference goes, let's march into the future with responsibility and resilience. So I would say we all can make it happen together. So thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak to with all of you. Wishing you all the best uh, and a very successful conference. And I'm sure at the end of the day, there'll be a large number of uh, takeaways and anything that the IRDA can do, I would like to assure you that we will offer all our services in taking the sector forward. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Are there any questions from the audience to Mr. Panda? There is one. Can we have the mic there, please? Uh, hello, sir. My name is Akshay Dhan. Uh, thank you so much for an informative uh, uh, discuss, uh, talk. One question which I have is, uh, while the IID is actually uh, looking to increase the number of insurance companies in the country, and I'm specifically talking about life insurance, the current set of insurance companies themselves are struggling with, uh, due to, at least some of them are struggling due to lack of distribution models. And, uh, you know, after the top five or the top ten, the kind of business which is being sold by the remaining 10 or 15 odd is fairly small. And uh, despite lots of efforts, the, the, the sort of uh, volumes have not uh, shown any increase. So what hope do future insurance companies have in India if the current ones, and some of them are part, being partnered by very big insurance companies abroad, abroad 
if they don't have, uh, they are struggling with dis distribution models and volumes, what hope do future insurance companies have in India? Specifically, I wanted to talk about life insurance. Okay. So, so very quickly to answer your question, the, the, as I said, we have a huge market, untapped market with a huge potential. The insurance penetration is around 4.2 percent, putting life and uh, non-life together. Now, the question is that, as I said, the regulatory regime is changing, number one. Number two, there's a more open architecture of the distribution network now. It's been opened up from the current nine to, uh, from three, three to nine, which in, in other words, uh, you know, insurance companies can partner with 27 corporate agents. We are talking of mainstream technology. We have a regulatory sandbox now on a continuous manner. Any insurtech player can file their application. We are nudging the insurance companies or we are rather appealing to them that why don't you partner with these insurance companies for providing end-to-end -end solutions for customers. Number three, the regulations currently are offering, uh, made a series of changes for you know, raising capital as well. You can, uh, as far as the other forms of capital are concerned, uh, besides the equity, then without prior approvals also they can go to the market and raise that capital and grow their businesses. Now, as far as the distribution models are concerned, the distributors are also being nudged to become more and more uh, uh, tech savvy. So a host of other measures are also being taken to make the distribution uh, in this country more efficient. We need more distributors, so therefore more distributors uh, are also being encouraged to you know, uh, start their uh, 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 distributions uh, in different uh, geographies of the country, uh, whether they are individual agents or whether they are corporate agents, whether they are brokers or insurance marketing firms. So a lot of new concepts are also on works. So as and when they develop, we will share that with the media. So uh, a host of measures are being taken parallelly to make the sector happen because there is a market, there is a potential and there is a, we have to create that demand and that demand will happen when we reach out to the people. So technology will be one of the enabler and of course the conventional uh, uh, models will have to be strengthened uh, with the technology platforms. That's one. Now, when I talk of having more companies, you see, if you look at the banking sector, you have large banks, you have the scheduled commercial banks, you have non-banks also, the non-banking financial companies, you have micro-financial institutions, you have the cooperative banks, you have regional rural banks. Why? Because you need to, our country is huge, 1.4 billion, one-fifth of the world's population. Now, you cannot manage that with 70-odd companies. So you need to reach out to them, you'll have to have a geographical presence in a few districts maybe, or in a few states, or in one state. So the focus has to be state-centric. Although we have started embarking upon a state insurance plan, we are now the insurance companies are engaging with the state governments who will become equal partners in the growth and penetration of insurance. So a multifold approach is being made to enhance the penetration, to deepen insurance inclusion, to reach out to the nook and corner of the country with a variety of products which are specific to their needs. So therefore, the IRD has also now allowed the insurance companies to use and file products. They don't require a prior approval of the IRDA as far as launch or innovation or uh, bringing a new product to the markets are concerned. So I think we can't do one after the other. It has to be a multi-pronged approach and that is what we are looking at. Uh, morning, Mr. Banda. This is uh, Srivats from Business Line newspaper. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question around uh, the set of second uh, round of reforms that uh, yourself and the government had proposed on the insurance side. So the public comments were invited and the responses have reached uh, the government. So if you could update us on what is the status of those planned reforms and do you expect them to be moved in the upcoming second leg of the budget session? 
how hopeful are you about it? I think that's difficult for me to comment. I think Secretary, uh, Department of Financial Services would be, uh, uh, but I mean, he would be the one who will be able to update you on that. But yes, uh, it, uh, the, the comments uh, the government had sought has also, uh, the date has closed. I'm sure uh, it should be in the offing, but I can't tell you exactly when it's going to be laid uh, in the House or when it will get approved by the Parliament. So I think we'll have to wait for that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. This indeed was a very informative session. We have a lot of key takeaways from it. We clearly understand that there are expectations from the industry, and I think we are confident that we'll be able to live up to it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, and namaskar to all of you. Have a nice day.